Roger, Roger um, uh, is unique in the world of collecting because he probably is the last collector um, uh, who, who could actually physically assemble, who could have physically assembled the rarities that, that he indeed did manage to, um, uh, to gather together and that are now at Lewis and Clark College. Uh, the, 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 so it's, it is a remarkable achievement, and it is something that, that had people gasping, uh, incredulous at, at, uh, at uh, his perseverance. You know, it was kind of interesting. Everybody says, well, how did this all start? And I say, well, they say, this is a strange, strange title for a book. Shotgun on my chest. Why is it called Shotgun on my chest? And so I usually just go to the first page of chapter one and read them the first sentence. And maybe they'll have an understanding, or I could read the short paragraph. On the evening of March 18th, 1986, I jumped into bed, pulling the covers over my stark naked body, shotgun on my chest. And you can read on if you get a copy of the book, and, and you'll see <laughs> what brought me to that insane idea to sleep with a 12-gauge shotgun for 15 years. And thank you folks for, you know, coming out and, and listening to a story uh, about a nut. Uh, in 2001, I was dressed in these clothes, sleeping at Fort Mandan in North Dakota, 10 below zero, foot of snow on the ground, and my sleeping bag was a buffalo robe. I was trying to reenact Lewis and Clark, and uh, a part of their journey. And while I was there, this was early on prior to the bicentennial, it was big news. Uh, this was truly America's epic, the story of Lewis and Clark. And I was talking to a lady who was just, you know, casually, I didn't know who she was. Uh, I wish I would have before I said what I said. She was a writer for the LA Times. Um, this was on uh, the week following, uh, I was on the front page of the LA Times with my oversized, not this hat, but another fur hat. And the story started out, <laughs> I remember, this is what I said to her, I said, you know, she said, well, what got you interested in all this? I said, well, I'm a history nut, and there's a lot of us out there. So, the first sentence, I'm a nut, and there's a lot of us out there. <laughs> and I still, I still laugh at that because all publicity really started in this. People say, Roger, you're not a scholar per se. You don't have a college degree. Uh, are you a reader of books? No. I really wasn't a reader of books. I was an outdoor person. Uh, I liked working with my hands. I liked hunting, fishing, those types of things. I didn't like to sit and read. But... In 1975, I left to go to Europe for a year with a backpack, and, and my plans were to taste all the wines and uh, meet a lot of women and have a great time for about a year, hitchhiking around Europe. But just after I left, and I didn't know this until I returned, my grandmother had passed away. And I didn't know this either, but when she was a little girl, she was at the Lewis and Clark World's Fair that was held in Portland in 1905, the centennial of the expedition. And she had a plate like this. I have a stack of 100 at home. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> uh, it's a beautiful caption of Lewis and Clark and Lady Liberty wrapped in the American flag, apparently standing on the beach at Seaside, which is not necessarily correct. But it's a beautiful plate, flow blue plate, and on the back it says, Souvenir. Lewis and Clark Centennial, Portland, Oregon, 1905, Staffordshire, England. And uh, when she had passed, uh, she had been in a rest home, and uh, a lot of things had been levied to take care of her health. So there wasn't much left in her estate, um, and so when it was sold, I wasn't home. And my mother thought this might be kind of an interesting thing for me to, as a memento for my grandmother and to remember her. And I, I thought, wow, this is really neat. I could never sell it, you know, as being a treasure of my grandparents. So that's what got me started, collecting Lewis and Clark material. The bid now rose in $500 increments. 
I wanted that set of books. I thrust my pal skyward at 7,500! And instantly felt a sharp pain in my right side where Mark Wessel had just delivered a commanding blow to my rib cage with his elbow, whispering, Stop! It's not worth that much! As the gentleman in the middle of the room again nodded for the call from the auctioneer for $8,000. <laughs> Folks around the room began to murmur, What were we doing? I knew if I went to 8500 I would win. I just knew it. <laughs> I remember telling Mark and Michael at the beginning, I was only going to 6500 Hey, I was already $2,000. What the hell? This set will be mine, dammit. I flashed my paddle, indicating I'm in. Just as quickly, the guy gave the nod for $9,000. The room was starting to buzz. We were nearly 3000 over the high-end bid, double what a standard fine set should be worth. Bob Haynes turned 180 degrees and looked back to see who the crazy people were. <laughs> well, he knew I was one of them. I could read his lips in his eyes. Roger, what the hell are you doing? To the left, eight chairs away. My friend Lud Trosbeck, nearly standing up, pulling his hand across his throat, motioning as, as if to stop, cut off, in true theatrical pantomime, only to rival the late great Red Skelton. <laughs> I knew what he was motioning. Stop, you're crazy. Suspense filled the room. I heard another, another voice from behind. Go for it, Roger. Take it to the limit. Unfortunately, I had already passed that. I started to lift my paddle up again. Mike Lieberman reached across and grabbed my arm. Mark and Mike both grabbed my arm. My good friends were only trying to save me from financial demise. But I was a fit, healthy, heavy construction man, and I thrust my arm forward out of their grasp, answering to the request for $9,500. There were straight outright comments now. It could clearly be overheard. What are these guys doing? A voice from the left said, I thought he would stop. I heard another from behind. That one guy is a Lewis and Clark nut. <laughs> Surely another bidder recognized who I was and would extend me the courtesy and bow out. As Douglas John took a second call, going twice, the gentleman in the middle of the room nodded again, yes, at $10,000. Now the bid changed to $1,000 increments. I was in a cold sweat, nervously shaking. I had exceeded my ceiling. I really didn't have the financial means to cover the bid where I was at the time. We're getting close. As Johns started to sing out, going once, in the back of my mind I thought, will I go bankrupt to bankruptcy court over this set? Going twice! Rang out my left ear with a morbid thought, I can't lose this fantastic set of books. That's what it was like at 2.12 in the afternoon at PBA Galleries as I took one last deep breath and raised my paddle for, my paddle for a final time at $11,000. I was beleaguered. I could go no further. I knew it. I sat for that chilling second as Johns called out, The bid is now at $12,000. The man in the center of the room commanded the attention of the floor. All eyes were cast upon him now. The stranger gave another positive nod. As Johns called out, the bid is now at $13,000 going once. And he looked right at me. <laughs> going twice. Bam! Echoed across the gallery. Sold for $12,000! A hammer fell with a thud like a cleaver of a guillotine. I sever my dream of ownership. The paddle fell out of my grasp and hit the floor with a clunk, echoing across the shock-filled room. I had been defeated. My first loss at an auction where I was bidding for something I really wanted.